Hebrews chapter 5. You know, as it, it seems a little boring or a little slow as we're going through this great book of Hebrews, but I assure you, if you just stick with it throughout the entire book, you're going to, we're going to find some exciting, uh, interesting ways to understand the perfect high priest, Jesus Christ. So Hebrews chapter five, let's pray. Father, let your word become clear. Let it not be the word of men or man, but the word of God, sharp and transforming. It is in that anticipation we pray. Amen. Hebrews chapter five, verses one. We're going to learn a few things here in the first six verses of Hebrews chapter five. We'll learn that one, no angel with supernatural power could serve as high priest. Two, only men identified as weak with the weakness of humanity could serve as high priest by appointment only. And three, Christ became high priest appointed by his father and was identified with his people through his suffering. So open your Bible to he Hebrews chapter five and let's unpack these verses and see what the spirit of God is saying to the church. Are you there? Verse one, every high priest taken from among men, men is appointed on behalf of men and things pertaining to God in order to offer gifts and sacrifices for sin. The position of high priest in the Levitical system was by appointment only. They represented and served at God's appointment. The phrase gift and sacrifices in this verse covers offerings of several different kind called for in the work of the Old Testament priests. And you can read about that in Leviticus chapters one through five. But our main interest in verse one is the sacrifices offered for sins. Israel's high priest stood between God and the people. The high priest entered the tabernacle or the temple to offer gifts and sacrifices on the people's behalf to make atonement for sins. He was a go-between, a mediator. Verse two says, he is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray since he himself is subject to weaknesses. Verse two carries the idea of the high priest maintaining a controlled and gentle attitude. Impatient, the lack of enthusiasm and anger have no part in priestly ministry, since the priest himself is subject to weaknesses. The high priest is also clothed with weaknesses according to the scripture, and we'll find that in this next verse, verse three. This is why he, that is the priest, has no, has to offer sacrifices for his own sins, as well as for the sins of the people. The, 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 the priest would be reminded of his own sinful humanity every time he he offered sacrifices for his sins. And, and I want to just say this, that before I pray for someone as a minister of the gospel, I need to ask God for forgiveness of my sins. Before you pray for someone, you need to ask God for forgiveness of your sins. We are reminded and reminding ourselves before God of our own weaknesses and sinfulness. So let's move on to verse four. No one takes this honor for himself, but he receives it when called by God, just as Aaron was. In this verse, the high priest was selected and called by God into service. You didn't apply for the job. You didn't jump up and down and say, here I am. Rather, a person had to be called by God just as Aaron was. Verse five tells us, so also Christ did not glorify himself so as to become a high priest, but he said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. This quotation from Psalms 2, 7, the writer demonstrates that Christ's incarnation and his priesthood were both by divine appointment. Understand Jesus's humanity does not in any way diminish his eternal deity, nor does it alter the essential qualities 
within the Trinity itself. It's important to note that Psalms 2 recognizes the Son as both King and Messiah. Christ is the King Priest. As we look at verse 6, it reads, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, this is quoted from Psalms 110.4. As the king of Salem and priest of the most high God at the time of Abraham, Melchizedek was also a king priest. And you can read that in Genesis 14, verses 18 through 20. Well, and we'll discuss Melchizedek. Uh, we'll discuss his priesthood in more detail in chapter 7. As we look at verses 7 and 8 here, having established the first requirement that a high priest be appointed, that's in verses 1, 4, and 6, the writer focuses on the requirement of being humanly sympathetic, which we read in verses 2 and 3. Verse 7 says, in the days of his flesh, he offered up both prayers and supplication with, the lot, with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his piety. The following context makes it clear that this refers back to Christ, the main subject in verse five. The author focuses on the fact that he offered prayers and appeals to God who was able to save him from death. Jesus Christ is the great God man, fully divine and fully human. He went through intense suffering and struggles, though without ever sinning. And, and, and Matthew, in Matthew 26, in Gethsemane, in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus agonized and wept, but committed himself to do the Father's will in accepting the cup of suffering, which would bring his death. In anticipation of the burden he would bear of the judgment for sin, Jesus felt its fullest pain and grief. Though he accepted the penalty in silence, he did not seek to deliver himself from it. And this amazing statement that I made from Isaiah 53, 7 is true because Christ was delivered up according to the definite plan and the foreknowledge of his father. He did cry for from agony in Matthew 27, 46, from God's wrath poured on his perfectly holy and obedient person. After his obedient death on the cross, Jesus did ask to be saved from remaining in death. That is to be resurrected. Let me read Psalms 16, 9 and 10. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will dwell securely, for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. Praise the Lord. Let's look at verse 8. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. Christ did not need to suffer in order to conquer or correct any disobedience. In his divine being, as the son of God, he understood obedience completely. He learned obedience from the same, for the same reason he endured temptation, to confirm his humanity and experience its suffering to the fullest. Christ's obedience was also necessary so that he could fulfill all righteousness and therefore proved to be the perfect sacrifice to take the place of sinners. First Peter 3 reads this way, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. He was per perfectly righteous. He was the perfectly righteous one. His righteousness would be imputed or assigned to sinners. Let me, let me say this. It's not our righteousness, but the imputed righteousness that we have in Christ. In fact, let me read Romans chapter 3, verses 25 through 26. 
concerning righteousness. God, Romans chapter three, verse 25, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this, that is God did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in for his forbearance, he had left sins committed beforehand unpunished. Verse 26, he did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Verse nine reads this way. He became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. And verse 10 reads, designated by God to be a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Again, quoting from Psalms 110, four again, the second time, the writer again mentions the call of God to the priesthood. Because of the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ and his perfect sacrifice for sin, he became the cause of salvation. True salvation will prove itself in obedience to Christ. Starting from initial obedience to the gospel command to repent and believe and to a life pattern of obedience to the word of God. Romans 6 reads this way. Do you not know that when you offer yourself to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. Verse 11, concerning him, we have much to say, and it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. Christ's priestly ministry after the order of Melchizedek is hard to explain because the readers in maturity, because of the readers in maturity, the Hebrew spiritual dullness, according to the writer, and slow response to the gospel's teaching prevented additional teaching at this time. This is a reminder to us that failure to apply the truth of the gospel produces lack of progress in spiritual advancement and in the, the, and the inability to understand or assimilate additional teaching. The Hebrews had not only received the gospel, they had also received spiritual revelation of the gospel consisting of the Old Testament scripture. Look at verse 12 and 13. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. Verse 13. For everyone who partakes only in milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. What it's saying here is believers ought to be teachers. If the Hebrews had readily obeyed the gospel of Christ, they would have been passing that message on to others. Sadly, they, they weren't experiencing Christ's deliverance because they were still in spiritual elementary school. What are these verses saying? Any believer who fails to move from milk to solid food, verse 12, milk being the content of God's word, while solid food is the spiritual application and the use of God's word to life, has some developmental issues and becomes stagnant in their spiritual development. And here's the point of verse 13. Anyone who lives on milk is inexperienced. Knowledge without obedience does not advance the person. In fact, by rejecting saving faith, the Hebrews were regressing in their understanding concerning the Messiah. They had been exposed long enough to the gospel to be teaching it to others, but were babies, too infantile and unskilled to comprehend, let alone teach the truth of God's word. And we see that a lot in Christians today, still on milk, needing to be fed. 
Finally, verse 14. But solid food is for the mature who because of practice their let me read that again. Solid food is for the mature who, because of practice, have their senses trained to discern good from evil. To be mature, you need solid food. Only in this way will your senses be trained to distinguish between good and evil so that you can live from a heavenly rather than an earthly perspective. This, in fact, is why God allows trials and tests in our lives to teach us how to trust him. The only way to grow in most things is through training and through practice. The Bible calls us not to take God's word casually, but intentionally in prayer and in meditation. You must internalize and put God's word into practice. Only then will you be equipped to make word driven decisions rather than circumstance driven decisions. The one who is transformed by the word and as a doer of the word will be blessed and show themselves to be a mature Christian. Next time, chapter six.